Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We're going to continue our inside look at the Catholic Church, world politics, and the extraordinary relationship, the extraordinary relationship between the United States and and the Holy See. This book is entitled The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, and you can get this book at Roman and Littlefield. I'm going to continue where we left off yesterday, backing up only uh, half a paragraph for continuity, and we're going to continue our discussion about how we got the form of government now known today as democracy. Sadly, most discomfortingly, democracy is another creation of the Jesuits, just as was communism. And uh, it's a hideous reality. But we will discover what is left secret to the American people today. At the bottom of page 6, on uh, the second part of chapter 1, entitled The Greatest of Evils to be Feared, the author writes... Given events on the political horizon in the late 18th century, the curriculum at St. Omer was notable. Along with Latin and Greek classics, students were given a steady diet, a steady diet of Catholic theology as interpreted by the intellectually probing Jesuits. This is what we call a Jesuit education. To those who laud the Jesuits, no better education can be had in the world. St. Omer's was a Jesuit college in Europe, and it was used to train Maryland Roman Catholics to help serve the Jesuit purpose for America. America was first and foremost to the Jesuits a mission. A mission to separate the colonies from Protestant Great Britain so that Roman Catholics had freedom of religion so that they could practice and prosper and grow to, an, a, to a controlling power, make America Catholic by law, and then use the United States, later to be called the United States, to conquer the rest of the world for the Jesuits and make the Pope of their choosing the ruling monarch of the world, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, thus reestablishing the old world order and simply call it new. The intellectually probing Jesuits educated Charles and John Carroll. Charles, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, John Carroll to become the first bishop of the United States of America, founder of Georgetown University, the most prestigious Jesuit institution of learning on the continent. And it is through this Georgetown, Jesuit Georgetown University, that the United States cultivates the intellectual cream of the crop, gives them Jesuit educations, and then shuffles them off into high government offices. And the more of these Jesuit trained uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants, the more control the Jesuits have in government. That's how America is be being made Catholic. Now continuing, he says, they would have been exposed to Thomas Aquinas's writing from the 13th century. Now remember, Thomas Aquinas, regarded by 
uh, the Roman Catholic Church to be the quote-unquote angelic doctor. And from this point forward, I will refer to him as demonic demon of the Roman Catholic Church. He was writing in the 13th century at the very height of the power of the, of the papacy during the Old World Order. And it says, but also to the works of 16th century Jesuit thinkers such as Spaniards, or excuse me, Spaniards Francisco Suarez and Juan de Mariana and Italian Robert Bellarmine. All three of these Jesuits, all three of these wrote voluminously on the form of government known as democracy, where the people are the, the authority. Very consistent with Protestant teaching, but for a Jesuit purpose. Now, why would the Jesuits shift gears when all throughout their history prior to this time, they depended upon their influence among the papally elected kings of the nations? And when a king was recalcitrant, they would rely on making alliances with the so-called parliaments, those portions of the government that might represent the people. And they pitted one against the other, always seeking to gain uh, advantage, one or the other. And finally, finally, after having so much trouble trying to control politics, either through their, inf their, their influence with the king or their influence with the Protestants, pitting them one against another. Finally, the Jesuits said their only way the world can be uh, uh, governed appropriately is if we control the people. Okay? Plan A didn't work. Plan B didn't work. So we're going for the people. Our influence now is going to be for the people. We have to make the people fit for a global religion, <clears throat> a global government, and a global economic system. We have to shape the world to be fit to live in a global society over which will rule the papacy of our choosing. And so they built colleges all over the world. And nowhere less, uh, nowhere more so than the United States of America. Twenty-eight Jesuit universities in this country, twenty-eight of them. Now, these authors were, in their way, as rousing as John Locke on the subject of liberty. What is liberty to a Roman Catholic? Let me explain. Liberty to the Jesuits is liberty to serve the Pope, to worship. God, as it were, the Pope, without resistance. And not only that, to make the whole world subservient to the papacy. Not just Protestants. The whole world. It's After all, their mission will not be accomplished until the whole world ultimately bows down to this global monarch. Now, he says, these authors were, in their way, as rousing as John Locke on the subject of liberty. In Summa Theologica, that is, Thomas Aquinas' theological dissertation, volume after volume after volume, this uh, demonic doctor, Thomas Aquinas, distinguished between just and unjust government, proposing that subjects had the right to rise up against an unjust tyrant and even commit tyrannicide in certain extraordinary circumstances. So how is this different than the teaching, the historic and the orthodox teaching of the Roman Catholic Church? Under the old re regime, the old world order, nobody had the right except the Pope to unseat a king or a potentate. He crowned them, and only he could uncrown them. If one were to assassinate a papal king, one would be labeled a heretic and burned at the stake. Okay, the people were to be ruled. In Roman Catholic canon law, there are two classes of people, the sheeple and the ruling class. And you're going to hear in this new Catholic world uh, a distinction between clergy and the people. You're already hearing discussion among uh, 
the the uh, the priests and the pastors of the churches of America making this distinction. They they're calling themselves the priestly class. Okay, that they are to help conform the people to become fit for a global religious leader. <clears throat> okay, the Bible pl clearly says Christ is our head and we are all brethren. There's no such thing as a priestly class in, in God's house. We are all a nation of priests and kings, according to the Bible. So we look at one another on an equal platform. Every one of us vessels for the presence of the Holy Spirit, and every one of us led by the Scriptures, thereby being led by the Holy Spirit. And there's no distinction between the people and the quote-unquote priestly class. This is Jesuit education manifesting itself in the churches today. And you see pastors now putting away their three-piece suits and now wearing a frock. Some of them even dare to fashion their own bishop's mitres out of paper mache and wear them to church, don't they? First thing you know, they'll be teaching us, well, maybe us Protestants have been a little bit too hard on Mary. And now the emphasis will shift toward Mary, making us more and more consistent with this global new religion coming. All right, these authors were, uh, as he uh, says, in Summa Theologica, Aquinas, the demonic doctor, Thomas Aquinas, distinguished between just and unjust government. In the old world order, an unjust government was whatever government disobeyed the Pope. At that point, the Pope could commission entire nations to wage war against that unjust tyrant. Okay, it was the Pope who unseated unjust tyrants. But the Jesuits, Thomas Aquinas, and these architects of the democratic a society that we now live in where Protestantism is the majority rule and they believe the people should have the power, it says that, that Thomas Aquinas proposed that subjects had the right to rise up against unjust tyrant and even commit tyrannicide in certain extraordinary circumstances. So now it becomes advantageous to allow the people to rise up against the king. You see the Jesuits in the works here? They're focusing all their attention on the people. They're educating the people from kindergarten to, to the advanced degrees in Jesuit training. It's the people who are the power now. And the Jesuits are going to control the people through the schools and the churches. And uh, if it happens that someone that's not uh, regarded as a benevolent by the Jesuits can be rebelled against by the people and overthrown. And are there examples in history of presidents of the United States being assassinated because they disagreed with the Jesuits or they disagreed with the Pope? Read the book as we have done here on Inquisition Update, The Secret Terrorist by Bill Hughes or The Enemies Unmasked by Bill Hughes or Charles Chinnicky's 50 Years in the Church of Rome dealing with the assassination of presidents, one of which was Abraham Lincoln, but there were more. Read Eric John Phelps' book, Wounded in the House of My Friends, talking about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, the first Roman Catholic president of the United States, yes, was assassinated by the Jesuits. A Jesuit plot to overthrow President John F. Kennedy, who defied the papacy and stopped, tried to stop the the Roman Crusade, the Holy Roman Crusade against the Buddhists of Vietnam. On and on and on. Sappers and Miners, another book we've read here on Inquisition Update. 
Have there been assassinations of presidents in the in this country? Yes. Following the Jesuit dictate. Okay? Even to commit tyrannicide in certain extraordinary circumstances. The Jesuit writers took this line of thought a little further, expanding the conditions for resistance against corrupt monarchs. Rulers ruled with the consent of the people, the Jesuits argued, and lost legitimacy when they lost consent. Such ideas did not sit well with Europe's monarchs and would eventually haunt the Jesuits. This is a reference to uh, the European blue-blood papal monarchs rising up against the Jesuits and demanding that Pope Clement XIV suppress and extinct make extinct the Jesuit order, ending their existence forever in a papal bull. Okay? In the meantime, in the meantime, the education at St. Omer armed its students well, both intellectually and morally, for the looming battle for liberty. Thomas Aquinas' writings... Suarez's writings, Mariana's writings, and Robert Bellarmine's writings all were learned at St. Omer's in Flanders. Charles Carroll and, and, and John Carroll were students of that education, and they were, being, they were being educated to help overthrow the tyrant in England, the king of England to separate the colonies from Protestant influence from England. Yes, I know you've been taught that the, the, the Revolutionary War was all about tea and taxes. No, no, no. Tea and taxes was the cover. Tea and taxes was the legitimate cloak to cover up the religious intent of the Jesuits' fomentation of the Revolutionary War. The Jesuits had to separate the colonies from Protestant Great Britain, or their mission would be lost. Their mission to make America Catholic would be lost, and America might well become a Protestant nation in word and deed, and in constitution, and its form of government, and might become the power that it is today but a Protestant power in, in its efforts to denounce the papacy and all papal forms of government and give God's people a chance to know the truth and be set free by the truth, set free from the Jesuits, set free from the papacy, set free from Antichrist. The Jesuits could not let that happen. They couldn't create their global monarchy under their satanic puppet, the Pope, and rule with a rod of iron God's holy people if Protestants remained in existence in the world, and worst of all, if it became the religion of the most powerful nation on the planet. It was imperative that the early controlling figures in our, in our revolutionary or colonial period were well-trained, Jesuit-trained Roman Catholics, Charles and John Carroll. And the product that resulted was a democracy separate from England, where Protestants who feared Roman Catholicism now had to concede religious liberty to Catholics. And now they occupy Washington, D.C. And worst of all, absolutely worst of all, was Vatican Council II, where the Protestants laid down their Protestant swords and decided to get in bed with their whorish Romish mother. That's when America truly became the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> and it's all about liberty. But never forget, always remember and never forget, the word liberty has a world, a universe of difference 
it out of the mouth of a Jesuit than it does out of the mouth of a Protestant. The definitions are diametrically opposed. Now, continuing, he said, John's cousin, John Carroll's cousin, Charles Carroll, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, as he's often referred to, left Europe and returned to Maryland in 1764 to take his place as his father's heir. So Charles Carroll, having been Jesuit at Jesuit trained at Omers at St. Omers, came back to accept his father's inheritance. John remained in Europe to continue his Jesuit education. It says by the early 1770s, Charles was caught up in the political fervor in the colonies. He engaged in a widely publicized debate in a Maryland newspaper, emerging as a brilliant and inspiring proponent for the cause of liberty under the pseudonym, quote, first citizen, unquote. Now, Charles Carroll didn't expose his true identity because he would be as instantly recognized as a Maryland Roman Catholic. And those who were in the know would have known that he was a Jesuit-trained Maryland Roman Catholic. So under the pseudonym First Citizen, Jesuit-trained Roman Catholic revolutionary Charles Carroll of Carrollton engaged in a popular, widely read debate in a Maryland newspaper, thus gaining even more support, popularity. Now, Charles' entry into politics was remarkable, given that he and his fellow Catholics still had no right to vote in Maryland, their own colony. Further attestation that Roman Catholicism was thoroughly suppressed by the Protestants in the rest of the colonies. Now, John Carroll took a different route after St. Omer. He remained in France and entered a Jesuit seminary. Ordained a Jesuit priest in 15, excuse me, in 1759, John Carroll took his final vows in 1771. So he had a 20-some-odd year, 27-year education in Jesuit theology, Jesuit politics, Jesuit uh, 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 diplomacy, Jesuit casuistry, Jesuit sophistry. In other words, the art of lying. That's what it is, the art of lying. It's one of the arts of war, the art to tell a lie and convince yourself that it's not a lie or convince yourself that it's not wrong. You can be a powerful, self-justified liar if you are a well-trained Jesuit or a well-trained Jesuit politician. All right. Ordained a priest in 15, or 1759, Carroll took his final vows in 1771. He's a fully vested Jesuit. He's been through the entire curriculum of the Jesuits. He's a professed Jesuit at this point. His timing could not have been worse, according to the author. This was precisely the moment when Europe's Catholic monarchs, including the rulers from France, Spain, Portugal, and Sicily, every one of which are Roman Catholic nations, decided they had had enough of what they perceived to be the Jesuit meddling and seditious behavior. Okay? It was the Jesuits who were promoting democracy, governments of, by, and for the people, which upset the blue blood monarchs. And, and supposedly upset the, the well, the bluest blood of them all, the Pope, from where everyone else got their blue blood, the Pope, see? So the Jesuits are in trouble with these monarchs. And the Jesuits are in trouble with the Pope. They're promoting governments of, by, and for the people. Why? No, no time in the history of the Roman Catholic Church were the people given any rights. They couldn't even read the Bible for themselves. It was outlawed. And the Jesuits want to give the people rights? That's overthrowing the monarchy. That's overthrowing the papacy itself. So they had the Jesuits suppressed and forever exterminated by a papal bull. We'll get back to it 
when we come back from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back after these messages. Pledge allegiance to the King of Kings and to his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One holy nation and our heavenly Father, grace, mercy, justice for all. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Wow, the weather is beautiful, the cabin is terrific, and it's the first day of our vacation. Yeah. Honey, is there something wrong? Yeah, I just realized we forgot to pack the travel Berkey system. I can't drink this cabin water. And what am I going to do when I'm out on the lake? Now the whole vacation is ruined. Honey, cheer up. I brought our Sport Berkey purifiers. What? Yeah, I know you're picky about not having pathogenic bacteria, organic chemicals, heavy metals or foul tastes and odors in the water. So I packed our Sport Berkey purifiers. You know... This is a terrific cabin, and wow, have you noticed the beautiful weather? Don't ruin your vacation. Get a travel Berkey today for only $209, or get a sport Berkey for only $39 by calling 559-781-3773, 559-781-3773, or order on the web at firstamendmentradio.com. Travel Berkey not yet available in Iowa. Okay, we're back from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to contact me, please do so by, via email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. And I'll be happy to answer uh, your email if it requires one. And I appreciate the support uh, that I've recently gotten in email. And uh, very much appreciate any word of kindness <laughs> you can't go up against the beast and her image without riling a few feathers so uh, if you uh, like inquisition update please continue to listen and invite your friends and family to do so for and thanks to first amendment radio for sponsoring the program all right charles carroll the jesuit the the marlboro man john carroll Jesuit train, professed Jesuit at a most critical time in history. 
The papacy had lost most of Europe because of the Protestant Reformation. Europe had turned against the papacy, calling him Antichrist! Antichrist! There was only one hope a Protestant colonies with only one Roman Catholic colony amongst them and one Jesuit priest that we talk about. There were others, trust me. The Jesuits had flooded this country. They'd made treaties with the Indians. They had waged war, pitting one nation of Indians against another. They had trade routes established all over the country. That's why there's so many Catholic Na- uh, cities named after Roman Catholic priests from Texas through Arizona, New Mexico, all up and down the western seaboard. Every 30 miles was a Jesuit mission. This country was thoroughly canvassed by the Jesuits before, well, before we could even get our foot in the air. It was claimed by the Pope through Christopher Columbus. Immediately the Jesuits explored the country, assessed its value in natural resources and in human resources and in every other kind of resource, and they informed the papacy this is going to be one of the most, if not the most, powerful, wealthy, and influential nations on the planet. And at the very time when you've lost all of Europe, you pope, your last best hope is continental United States of America. We must make America Catholic. And we need some help from the Carols and other Maryland Roman Catholics. We need help from Protestant British Parliament. We need help from France and Spain. We are going to make America Catholic come hook or crook. Okay, and I use the terms advisedly, the hook and the crook being the crozier carried by the popes, the Antichrist of the Bible. John Carroll took a different route than did his cousin Charles after St. Omer. He remained in France and entered a Jesuit seminary, ordained a Jesuit priest in 15, uh, seven, I keep doing that, 1759, John Carroll took his final vows in 1771. His timing could not have been worse. This was precisely the moment when Europe's Catholic monarchs, including rulers from France, Spain, Portugal, and Sicily, decided they had had enough of what they perceived to be the Jesuits' meddling and seditious behavior. The Jesuits' calling card is politics and war. Politics and war. These monarchs had been virtually overthrown by the Protestant Reformation. And here were the Jesuits promoting another form of of, of government called democracy, where the people ran and ran the government, and that left absolutely no future for these blue-blood papal monarchs. And it even threatened the papacy. Well, you you can't have the people ruling if the pope rules. You can't have the priestly class headed up by the papacy if the people have all the power. You, you gotta not, you've just got to understand that from these papal rulers, these blue bloods, these divine writers in Europe that had lost control of Europe, the papacy included because that's where they got all their blue blood and divine right power. All of them had lost all their power. And the Jesuits seemed to be at war with the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope and the monarchs and in favor of the people who had overthrown their authority, calling them Antichrist. So on August 16th, 1773, Pope Clement XIV buckled under the monarch's demands to put the religious order, the Jesuits, out of business. And I will add the word permanently. Deciding that the Jesuits were more trouble to the Roman Catholic Church than they were worth... He issued a papal bull known as Dominus Ac Redemptor. The Society of Jesus was thereby suppressed. Okay, it's a papal bull. It comes under the the divine right rule of of, uh, infallibility. 
Anytime a pope writes a bull, it is as if God himself is speaking. And God, of course, does not alter a thing that comes forth from his mouth. So a papal bull is permanent. It can't be undone by anybody, even a successive pope. Otherwise, they destroy the foundation of the papacy, inerrancy, infallibility. God on earth. Now, other places, other authors don't call it a bull. They call it a brief. Of course, that justifies the historical reestablishment of the Jesuits at some future date, which did occur. But it was a bull, according to this author, and the Jesuits were suppressed. Just when the Jesuits were at their height of power, the Jesuits were supposedly suppressed. Where did that leave Jesuit John Carroll? Well, he had a bounty on his head because the papal bull insisted that if any Jesuit was found they were to be executed. All right? These Jesuits had to go underground. The Jesuits that occupied the Maryland colony and were spies all up and down the coast on in the other 12 colonies, they were also suppressed. They were incognito. As a matter of fact, they w infiltrated into Freemasonry. When the Jesuits were suppressed, they simply went underground, calling themselves at first the Illuminati, and then after the apparent destruction of the Illuminati, where they resurfaced was Freemasonry. And the, and the, the uh, proof of that is that one of the greatest proponents of futurism, the idea that the papacy never was the Antichrist of the Bible, but that a future individual who comes on the world scene just seven years before Christ's return, he will be the Antichrist. We don't have to be concerned about him, see? And matter of fact, then the obvious logic is that if the papacy never was the Antichrist, then the Protestant Reformation was, well, a tremendous assault against the throne of Almighty God in Rome. And that not only should the Protestants come back to the Roman Catholic Church and support the Pope's, uh, the Pope's authority, but they should go to war and restore what was lost after the Protestant Reformation. All of Europe, the world. And that's exactly what the United States has done. It has undone the Protestant Reformation. And it has been the most proficient artificer of war for the papacy that the papacy could ever dream of. Now you know what the Jesuits found out when they explored this land, found out its potential, and insisted that it be made Catholic and then be used as a battle axe to restore papal control over the whole world. And most of that took place during the apparent suppression of the Jesuits. At the very height of Jesuit power in the world, when they had in effect overthrown the papacy and the monarchies, they were apparently suppressed. And during that suppression, they went underground and they achieved their greatest achievements in history. And one of those greatest achievements was the Revolutionary War. First, to make Roman, to make America Roman Catholic, it has to be rid of Protestant influence from Great Britain. That's what the Revolutionary War was really all about. And you thought it was about tea and taxes. I thought it was all about tea and taxes until God opened my eyes. The author continues, he says, The bull was, what, quote, one of the unfairest pontifical acts in the history of the papacy, unquote. 
one biographer of John Carroll has written. The papal historian Eamon Duffy calls it, quote, the papacy's most shameful hour, unquote. For John Carroll, the suppression was a devastating blow. Quote, I'm not and perhaps never shall be recovered from the shock of this dreadful intelligence, unquote. He wrote home to his brother Daniel, quote, the greatest blessing which in my estimation I could receive from God would be immediate death, unquote. Very dramatic words from a Jesuit who would serve the papacy so secretly and valiantly during the revolutionary period, John Carroll. He said, but God had other plans for John Carroll. In 1774, hoping to escape the despair that Europe had come to represent to him, he boarded one of the last passenger ships to leave England for the Chesapeake Bay before the Revolutionary War. The ancient warrior family, the Carrolls, were about to accomplish their greatest defeat. John Carroll was going to lead, along with his cousin, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, at a time when it looked like they had been completely defeated. Now, what did this do in the minds of all the Protestants? The Jesuits have been defeated. They're no more a threat. We can go on with our democratic nation, our Protestant nation. And little be known to them, they were succumbing to Jesuit plot to achieve religious liberty for Roman Catholics. The greatest of evils to be feared. Continuing now in part three of this, this chapter, he says, we have to imagine how difficult his homecoming must have been for John Carroll. He was 40 years old, well into middle age, and had been away for 27 years. Jesuit education for 27 years. Trust me, they don't waste any of those 27 years. He was so thoroughly educated a Jesuit that there, he was the, the man. He was the, the Jesuits' man in the colonies, no doubt about it. His religious family, the Jesuits, had been condemned and outlawed by the Pope. Right? All that did was, that was just for public consumption. The Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, had seemingly lost all of Europe. Even the Roman Catholic countries were rebelling against him. We had a new form of government on this continent. The Jesuits were suppressed. Protestantism seemed to be the, the you know, the predominant religion in, in the colony. It just looked like the Roman Catholic Church was toast. And the Jesuits were toast. So the Protestants weren't worried too much about the Pope or the Roman Catholic Church or the Jesuits. Antichrist was out of the picture. God had overthrown the, the Antichrist through the Protestant Reformation. So they kind of forgot about how much threat this greatest of evils to be feared really was in the colonies. Kind of rocked those Protestants to sleep. All right. His father, John Carroll's father, had passed away a few years earlier. His mother, whom he had not seen since he was 12, failed to recognize him when he first returned. And while much had changed in Maryland in the years that he had been gone, the colony still refused to grant him and his fellow Catholics the right to practice their religion as they pleased. Practically, a stranger in a strange land, Carroll moved in with his mother at Rock Creek, Maryland, where he built a small wooden chapel to serve local Catholics and began a, preparatory, a, a, a peripatetic ministry to more distant Marylanders and Virginians. Okay? Virginians coming under the influence of this Jesuit priest. Meanwhile, the winds of revolution were sweeping across the colonies. Here's your, your, your taxes and tea. The Boston Tea Party occurred a year before Carroll's return, 
in December of 1773, and by 1774, delegates of the colonies spurned by the intolerable acts, there's your taxes, as series of laws passed by the British Parliament after the turmoil in Boston were meeting in Philadelphia to discuss tactics against Britain. Yes, it's spelled B-R-I-T-A-I-N, but it was to discuss strategies against British Protestantism, okay? The first shots were fired at Lexington and Concord in the spring of 1775, and Bunker Hill came two months later. So the Jesuits have fomented the Revolutionary War to get it away from Protestant Great Britain and its influence and its navy to make America Catholic, to achieve religious liberty for Roman Catholics, not for Protestants. They already had religious liberty. They were, they just, well, there were only less than 1% of Catholics in the colonies. The Protestants didn't need religious liberty. They already had it. They only feared that tiny little Maryland colony. But they thought the Jesuits were extinct and exterminated by a papal bull. They thought the Roman Catholic Church was completely, well, an orphan in Europe. There was nothing to be feared. And so they were led by any wind of BS the Jesuits could foment. Of course, the Jesuits had to do it under a cloak. They couldn't do anything out in the open. So they staged the Boston Tea Party and they have had these, these intolerable taxes placed on the colonies. Now, you ask the question, how in the world did the Jesuits get a Protestant parliament to pass these so-called intolerable acts to foment a revolutionary war and to make America Catholic? It's real easy. You see, this author doesn't tell you everything. Charles Carroll made several trips back to the quote-unquote motherland, Great Britain. It, the book, The Ark and the Dove, which we read right here on Inquisition Update, doesn't go into a lot of detail at all about what Charles Carroll was doing in England at that time. Well, logic can tell you what Charles Carroll was doing. He was making allies with the Jesuits in England, and they were in control of the majority Freemasons in the Protestant Parliament. You see, Freemasonry is the most clever tact of the Jesuit order. The Jesuits infiltrated and got control of, or, or rather, of Freemasonry way back in England. They had allies among the Freemasons in Parliament. And though they professed Protestantism, they were indoctrinated with Jesuit theology. And the Freemasons were the ones who did the Boston Tea Party. Right? Dressed up like Indians. They were Freemasons. They were Freemasons who signed the, the, the uh, Constitution, right? Under the Declaration of Independence. It was Freemasons who led the Revolutionary War. The generals of the, of the uh, Revolutionary War were Freemasons. Washington, George Washington was a Freemason. Oh, yeah, I know. There's some that say that he was Protestant. May well have been, but he was a Freemason, and he was used by Freemasonry to achieve a Jesuit objective with or without his knowledge. I don't mean to disparage George Washington, but there's a legitimate argument both sides, whether he was Protestant or whether he was secretly Catholic, but no one disputes that he was a Freemason. And he led the revolution against England with Charles Carroll's support, with John Carroll's support, with Daniel Carroll's support. That can't be denied. So we're off to the races. The Jesuits have fomented another revolution 
the same plague that scourged Europe that finally got the Jesuits suppressed. They were now free through Freemasonry to continue their business. Charles Carroll was in England working with the Freemasons, getting control of Parliament, fomenting these intolerable acts to justify the war to cover up the religious crusade that the Jesuits were levying in the colonies. Charles Carroll was meeting with high-ranking Roman Catholic officials, high-ranking Jesuits. They, he, was, uh, he was gathering up funds to support the war on the, on the colony side and then fomenting the, the intolerable acts that justified the war. Charles Carroll, just like a Jesuit-trained Jesuit that he was, whether he, whether he wore the frock or not, he was a Jesuit. He had Jesuit education. He was doing the Jesuits' bidding, <clears throat> was working on both sides of the line, just like a Jesuit. The American Revolution was initially a mixed blessing for Roman Catholics living in the colonies, says the author. On the positive side, listen carefully, listen carefully, on the positive side, all the talk of liberty raised the promise of new freedoms, including freedom of religion. There you have it. Religious liberty was the aim and purpose of the Carols and all the Catholics of Maryland. They wanted religious liberty in this country. They were an extreme minority, could be wiped out in an hour. They didn't even have the right to vote, even in their own Maryland colony. They desperately needed to change the tide in the colonies, or it was bound to be Protestant in the end. One auspicious sign, says the author, Charles Carroll, though still unable to vote, attended the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1774. How in the world did this Roman Catholic Charles Carroll one who was suppressed, one who couldn't even vote in his own colony, one who was Roman Catholic and was not even allowed to practice his religion. How in the world was he part of the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia? I'll answer you. Simple answer. He was helped by the Jesuits and the Freemasons in the colonies and the Freemasons in the Parliament or in uh, the First Continental Congress that knew. He was a principal man. They needed Charles Carroll, just as they needed John Carroll. Some argue that the Jesuits had not yet influenced Freemasonry by this time. I disagree. All the evidence proves that Freemasonry was thoroughly serving the Jesuits. And it had even recruited Protestants without their knowledge to serve in Freemasonry to do the Jesuits' bidding without their knowledge. And that very well could have included General George Washington. But there's no other way to, exp to explain Charles Carroll, a Roman Catholic, in a Maryland colony where Catholicism was suppressed, a nation whose greatest, fear, uh, greatest of evils to be feared was Roman Catholicism and popery. How in the world did Charles Carroll uh, was allowed to attend the First Continental Congress and be influential in that, in that Congress? Because the Freemasons were going to overthrow England's rule over Protestant America and make it Catholic. The math works, and we're the victims of it today. You're losing your rights because of what happened in the pages of this book that we're reading today, and we'll, fit, we'll continue tomorrow on the program. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. I'll see you tomorrow. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. 
Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. 